Welcome to Hard Talk. We're going to pose some uh, interesting questions to our um, panel here that it relate to some of the issues that were raised yesterday. And I want to start off by talking about this whole issue about notions of partnership, because we talked a lot about partnerships between organisations in the south, and partnerships between organisations north to south. Right? We said we wanted to be grounded, so let's ground the conversation in the partnerships between IDS and you. Right? What's that been like, and what, what would a good partnership to you mean? I mean, this has been the first time for me personally to work with IDS as an organisation. Um, Songcare has, has built quite a good relationship and partnership with IDS and how we've experienced this project on collective action and ending gender-based violence has been incredibly forthcoming and open and accommodating. Um, from the start, uh, what I articulated was that we are in the midst of campaigning for a national gender-based violence strategic plan in South Africa. And because that's such a moving target, um, I needed to know that we're working with a partner that understands the flexibility of campaigning mm -hmm. and advocacy. Um, and unequivocally, IDS as a partner has come in with that understanding and, and that's helped. Mm -hmm. That's helped open the space for us to engage creatively <coughs> and, um, and effectively. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, in terms of what we could do differently or strengthen, um, I not necessarily I think just from IDS, uh, but from Sonke um, as an organisation, it would be good if we had taken more time at the onset to uh, we had time to engage the mobilisers in the project. Mm -hmm. Um, but as Sonke, I think that um, we probably should have taken more time to make sure that they understand what the end product means mm -hmm. in terms of the uh, mobilizing going forward. Um, and so thinking through uh, with ideas and colleagues about what that could look like mm -hmm. um, is important for me now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for me, uh, we are enjoying the partnership from last four or five years, and uh, and we there is a feeling that certainly uh, we feel co-traveler. So sometimes it is very uh, uh, is creating space, providing space to learn, to move forward. Uh, if I critique little the partnership, uh, this uh, is very good evolving process and and coming from. One, one types of partnership, within the partnership, one types of program and mm -hmm. project to next step. But uh, we have to think whether uh, some strategic planning, what we want to achieve in the partnership uh -huh. for longer term. And then we create uh, some project, some try to path, how we can achieve collectively, mm -hmm. uh, rather than only the creating a project and then moving from project to project. Uh -huh. yeah. Right, so more strategic, collective yeah. strategic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. yeah. mm -hmm. right. Um, so we started the, the partnership with IDS and it was, it was for me it was uh, really great because we had the space to do what we wanted and uh, we didn't feel confined in any certain space so mm -hmm. um, and then coming here I understood why is that it's just like everyone here is partners of IDS is more or less an activist in their own way mm -hmm. or a researcher so they understand how much people on the ground need that space and need that flexibility, as uh, Pia said. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, continuing this partnership mm -hmm. soon as we can. Mm -hmm. And deepening it as well. Mm -hmm. what, what would it take to deepen it? Um, I think that deepening it would mean more exchanges of knowledge and experiences between all of the countries' partners with IDS and IDS would more or less uh, act as a catalyst uh -huh. to uh, sort of smooth this <coughs> to smooth this experience to okay. everyone together. Okay. Yeah. For me, it's been very much uh, a balancing act in terms of some of the 
the challenges around working with small projects from project to project, uh, but finding the spaces to stay companions on that journey and coming back together often enough. Um, and it's not a call for big funding for a major, major program or anything like that, but we find, I find that uh, what drives me forward and, and what gets me to meet my colleagues every now and then, every few years, is a common kind of commitment to something that we, <coughs> we're working towards, but we're also learning together, and that's what keeps it dynamic for me. And um, th the problem with, I, I very much see that point, it would be great to have an opportunity to kind of strategically plan in a long term, but without kind of program funding, that to me is still a bit of a pipe dream. Mm -hmm. And um, I really value the opportunity to bring like-minded people together and um, have those moments of reflection and, and learning. Um, and it's very emergent and, um, and not as strategic as one might wish, but so, yeah. So there's funding realities that are There are funding realities that, that, that get, that compromise the possibilities, but I also think that there is, um, there's been a growing kind of, um, initially I was a lot less sure whether this would go anywhere. And um, so IDS, well, since I arrived at it back in 2006, seven, the issue of men and gender inequality became more of an issue and we tried to make it more of an issue and I think that's become more and more of a reality. But it is a long term, it's a long term journey for me and it's, it's kind of finding the allies and, mm -hmm. and building that over time. Mm -hmm. And some people will drop off, other people will join. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's also a, mind, a bit of a mindset around, you know, a hub spokes sense of thinking about it, um, so that, you know, IDS is at the centre and then you guys are on the peripheries feeding into the centre, and how would we mix all that up, challenge that, because I think one of the things that came up yesterday was south ownership of knowledge, south generation of knowledge, political and intellectual leadership coming from people in the places that the work is being done in, not coming from somewhere else. I mean, I, um, I, I can only speak for our experience um, and specific to the partnership of ideas. And so I think it's an important question generally, politically. What does it mean to work in a context of um, developed and developing? And what does developing even mean? Um, but if we, if we narrow it down to just this partnership, uh, I or, or organizationally has not experienced it like that. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been able to, and maybe we're fortunate, we've been able to articulate very clearly what our political and, and advocacy aspirations are. Mm -hmm. And um, as an organization, we, ha we are involved in many research studies and, and measuring the impact of what we're doing over the longer term. And so we've got a unit working on research and impact monitoring and evaluation that's seeped into what's happening regionally and in South Africa, and so a partnership with an institute like IDS is, an, is a benefit, is mm -hmm. an added value mm -hmm. for how we work. Um, and b b that might just be because of the nature of, of our organization. That mm -hmm. we, we don't just work in the context of South or developing, we work in the context of what could this look like at the global level right. when engaging men. Right. Um, but at the, at, the, at the heart or at the grassroots of, of what we do, it's really, the role of people like myself in, in a management position in an organization like Sonke or any other organization to make sure that it doesn't become a paternalistic mm -hmm. or a top-down um, relationship. Certainly IDS is coming as an academic institution, a uh, well-known institution and then and background is there. Uh, then anything is producing, it is easily accepted, uh, spreaded uh, and acknowledged the mm -hmm. things. Uh, so, what is the mechanism there where the always reflection on the uh, power relation? Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So how the partners, how the knowledge is going to empower the uh, people are involved in that in that uh, process, um, as well as I'm thinking the this it is very difficult to say in the in technical way this 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 step you will do and then it will be uh, resolved mm-hmm. and and the uh, power relation will be removed mm-hmm. and the looks very uh, uh, what can I say participatory democratic mm-hmm. democratic and and equal mm-hmm. actually it is very difficult right. so ideas have to create some atmosphere and have to always uh, create some measure measure scale that where they can see the empower process is going on mm-hmm. particularly when the knowledge is production and knowledge is one one source of power mm-hmm. so how the that is shifted there right in in the case of, of our partnership with IDS, um, yes, we decided what we should be doing in, in this partnership, and as you said, um, but at the same time, in order for IDS to be able to also be a partner in this, as you said, equal, and then participate in what, in, and suggest what we should do, then IDS will have to let go of the fact that you researchers. Because most of the researchers I've met, they just let things happen and then they do the research and then based on that they do their findings or give their conclusion or their thoughts on, on the matter. So if you would be in the, within the decision making, then you will no longer be just researchers and then, I don't know, you will affect your own research um, conclusions at the end in some, some way because you have, you're a participant in the process. Um, and for us, we were are always open to new ideas, mm-hmm. to new uh, challenge challenges. If uh, and you challenge us in our own methodology, we're fine with that, and it would be good, you know. But as long as the person who's coming to do that has knows the context uh-huh. and understands where we're coming from, right. and not just somebody who's from IDS has no like for Egypt has right. nothing about knows nothing about Egypt right. and what's going on, and then. He or she would just suggest something that right. might not go with the context. But it was useful that the IDS person had a distinct role within the whole process of, as the researcher. Yes, yeah. of course. And yeah. the research that, that the IDS produced was very useful for all of us uh, mm-hmm. Egyptians, and we used it uh, with our media and mm-hmm. other uh, outlets. So it was useful. Mm-hmm. Um, and. So, so it really depends on what you want to do. It's not a pipe dream, it's very mm-hmm. doable, mm-hmm. but you just have to know if you're ready to let go of that mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. mentality of, I'm a researcher. Right, okay. Um, a bit like Ricky, I think, I don't necessarily experience it that we are at the center of a hub. And that, um, and of course, I think we also share with, with the key partners that we have developed over time, I think we share a view or a philosophy or at least an ambition not to kind of have an extractive mm-hmm. um, learning process in the research and that the analysis we aim to, we try to, to kind of co-construct that learning uh, by, you know, analysis with partners mm-hmm. like in Kenya last year we were, you know, we had l- local research partners as well as, as activists and we had uh, consultation workshops where the preliminary findings were sort of explored and, and tested or um, debated. Mm-hmm. So that's one particular way. And, uh, and last year we saw in the Global Symposium, my experience there is that our partner CHSJ in South Asia is, is performing a function of a global convening of, of a symposium with thousand participants, far a lot greater than I think IDS has ever done, <laughs> as far as my, I'm, I'm aware. Mm-hmm. Um, or maybe we have convened some conference on development studies or something, uh, or or in, in South Africa, etc. Mm-hmm. It's the reality, as I see it, is that it's actually changed a lot, uh-huh. uh, and uh, we are far more in the this place in the global north, we are actually far more marginal to the, the process of generating new knowledge and so on. But but we hopefully bring something still. Yeah. Part of working with organizations is that you learn from that process. And with time you also develop your own models 
and, and power and, and ability to negotiate and understand the issues and you can run uh, uh, by yourself with time. Yeah, but uh, I think uh, ideas are also learned along the, the way, uh, if I understand it very well, and if, I, uh, if my understanding of this whole process, uh, my, my recollection is, is effective. I think you also learned along the way in the sense that um, the, uh, the, the process for me is a bit different now than it was in the past. Mm -hmm. I see a couple of these uh, publications, you have certain names actually featuring prominently. In the past, that wouldn't be the case. For those who are interested in having their names on publications, on reports, on papers, as idea creators, as uh, part of uh, the movement around building new knowledge, this is something that people uh, 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 should be proud of. I mean, coming from the from the from the from the coming from the start. But I think the fundamental question remains that this grant comes from somewhere, and the, we don't have a policy to the grants that lead to the production of this 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 knowledge. And and those who are in the forefront of getting it, who already have a reputation of getting it. Um, we have our argument around how those grants are used. So that is our the gatekeeping over the, the funding. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else comments? Yeah. Um, I think for me, uh, regarding the funding, uh, that that's an area where we really, I, I think, we need to work on very much because, for instance, if we generate this kind of knowledge and. Uh, like yesterday, we were talking about how do we utilize this knowledge and who is it for, where we take it, and whose voice are we representing, such kind of uh, issues. But then again, uh, if you go to the field, if you go back, for instance, in Kenya, uh, we already generate a lot of expectations from the people that we engage and interact with in these processes. And therefore, uh, the key question always remains, what is it after, after this process? What do you intend to do? Mm -hmm. and, and I think, uh, like I always say, is that we, we need to be in a situation or in a position where we can use the local structures to anchor our, our projects mm -hmm. such that there is an e exit or a face of strategy uh, so that the, the expectation level is not really heightened, so to speak, but it's manageable. Mm -hmm. Because the, the kind of funding that we receive from, from IDES, for instance, is really for short term and, uh, you know, the resources are not very... Um, like, uh, for, for lack of a better word, very tangible in terms of for long term kind of a process mm -hmm. that can make the project to really have a palpable kind of an impact on the ground. So, I, I think for me, we sincerely need to work on how then do we get resources for generating the information and utilizing that information in a way that also impacts the lives of the people that we interact with mm -hmm. at, at the local level. Mm -hmm. Because for me, that's what. And at the moment, I feel it's still really wanting. Like, for instance, five years down the line, we started a process uh, and the mobilizing men. And um, at certain point, the group and the, 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 the people that we started this process with, they keep on coming back to, yeah. to Medellin and asking, so what yeah. happened yeah. to this? And yeah. if we don't have resources from other funders, then it mm -hmm. becomes very difficult for us to be able to follow up with them. Yeah. So it is kind of piecemeal. And that, that's an area where we need to really put more efforts in, yeah. apart from just researching, doing, uh, coming up and generating information and packaging it, then this information should be also filtered and, and filter down to the people that it truly matters. So some transparency yeah. around communication around what's what, what you know, yes. some collective organising and strategising around what you want to do and where the money could come from. Yeah. I think what's also important uh, to consider is that when the IDS partners up with um, a local um, organization, say like the SLF, it's SLF who becomes the face <coughs> of um, the, the whole collaboration and it's, let, let me speak to the, to, the, to the work that we did as all of us, um, the four of us, um, it's in this case, it was Sonke that was the face because the participants were uh, people who are already working with Sonke. But in other instances, like for the for, for SLF, um, you you 
you work with people and there's this collaboration that's managing you because you're coming in as a, a small guy um, mm -hmm. and you have to manage expectations this side and that side mm -hmm. and there's pressure coming from both mm -hmm. sides mm -hmm. and the end results are not always positive and I feel like there the usually isn't, like he's saying, the, what happens after. I think that's a big chunk of what's missing in all of this because we could get there and teach people, you know, video skills and, and, and. But that's also creating an expectation. People want to put stuff in their CVs. People want certificates after being part of a process where we say they gain skills. And yeah. th these are the realities that we now have to face as um, the, well, a facilitator even. Yeah. Um, and even though we get there and we say, this is what we're able to give you, this is what we're not able to, to give, people still think, no, but you have, you have funding. Why, why, what are you doing with this funding? Where are you taking it? We can see. Like you guys, you bring food, you bring the, the, the you know, the technical stuff, but you, we can't get anything from out of this. Mm -hmm. And I think these are some of the things that we have to consider when, well, as local organizations, before going into partnerships, that at the end of the day, you stay with these people. Yeah. You have to live in this community. Yeah. You have to answer the door each time they come back and they say what's next yeah. mm -hmm. and most of the time there is no what's next yeah. like he's saying if there's no other funding well uh, yeah. it's important um, that until you're alerted to this that from the get-go you ensure that there's enough um, time spent on everyone understanding what this is about mm -hmm. um, being clear about every role player's expectations and aspirations mm -hmm. for being involved. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, just a practical example, for us halfway through the project, I realized that we didn't factor in um, an advocacy action budget post the digital story process. Uh -huh. And we were able to, at that point, have a conversation with Sonke and ideas to think through, well, what's the parameters within this limited budget for me to be able to say, at a minimum, we're able to get those mobilizers kick-started into w how they want to use their stories, mm -hmm. if they want to use their stories for advocacy. Mm -hmm. and, and there's another layer of accountability there, right? Because there's individual accountability, organizational accountability, and then accountability across organizations mm -hmm. or institutions and organizations. And the mobilizers who came into this process were accountable to themselves as well as whoever they've brought into their story and the telling of that and accountable to the community action teams. So there's many different layers of it. Um, I'm not sure if I'm providing an answer, but I think that um, you know, accountability in, in essence in and of itself um, has to start with the personal. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think our colleagues answered it really well in terms of how do you decide to go into a project? Who sets the tone of what happens and um, who agrees the outcome of that? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I also had a few suggestions of how we could, um, in, in relation to the question around um, how do we make sure that the relationship isn't. Um, top down or, or, or what levels of accountability or opportunities are there for organizations to carry things forward. And um, I mean, one of the things that we were already thinking about is how can we take some of the content of this proposal and, and, and rewrite it into a country proposal for one of our government department of social development and yeah. say, look, this is what we've achieved with only 10 mobilizers. Mm -hmm. Would you invest in us actually replicating this? And so. You know, finding the opportunities is equally important. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, I mean, yeah. I think I'll stop there. Yeah. Mm. Anybody else? I, I think uh, sometimes uh, accountability looks very aesthetic things. Very aesthetics. You want to set the say in, in the more visible way that you are very much accountable. Mm -hmm. uh, 
towards the partner and towards the community are, are those are involved in providing the data are, are assisting you to create the knowledge uh, the challenge is how how you are going to review that are you accountable and uh, and that uh, what is the parameter of your accountable and you have fulfilled that parameter i think one is like partnership within the partnership accountability one could be okay sit uh, review the partnership jointly four five years later and then use try to assess whether you were and what was the uh, parameter you adopted and you fulfilled the whole mm -hmm. things uh, other certainly when we are using the data when you are using community for generate the data so how this is one maybe how to ensure that how the knowledge is going to used by that community and support by that community mm -hmm. it, uh, this can be very at the maybe the for donor uh, maybe the user in different way for the but what is the way for community uh, they can they can use the same knowledge for their own uh, own improvement own empowerment own work uh, even the making them visibility so i think the uh, we have to develop some system to assess the accountability at the various level mm -hmm. so at the partner level at the donor level at the community level and mm -hmm. and need to be review sometime mm -hmm. if it is never reviewed then then i think sometimes it looks very nice right. but never implemented so you need it systematized yeah mm -hmm. and i think your point is absolutely right regrouping but i don't necessarily see that as a big systematic kind of process or oh, we have to have our annual meeting or or a kind of five yearly maybe does help to systematize it to some extent but it has to be it has to be realistic and based on what we're trying to do together and independently because ultimately uh, for example so the mobilizing man program there might be possibilities of fundraising for those activities in Nairobi from specific I mean we've talked about this a number of times or in Delhi and so on and and the, the structural problem for an institution like IDS or any any research institution is that fundamentally we're not here to to fund activities on a, on a long term basis. Uh, but if we can come up with research plans that mm -hmm. span years, then maybe mm -hmm. it's a different issue. Mm -hmm. I agree on the point of transparency and of honesty when it comes to making your projects uh, specifically, and um, within my organization. We decided that we're not going to be like most of other bigger organizations, which is like it's a bit of a high, like it's hierarchy that is a decision making, mm -hmm. but rather that it's a collective participatory decision making, especially when it comes to what pro what kind of projects mm -hmm. we are going to implement. Um, and at that, based on those decisions, we are all becoming, we become all accountable for what happens. Mm -hmm. And for the past two years, we have had our own rough times and setbacks, but it was important for us to, all of us, to learn. Mm -hmm. Because if somebody just has the knowledge and then they just to impose it on others, saying that I know best because I have more experience than all of you, it turns out it becomes sort of this, what we like, this patriarchal way mm -hmm. of I know better, like what, like what the outside world or the system is trying to impose on us, and we decided we're not going to be like that. Um, I have been guilty of trying to impose that sometimes, but then somebody would go like Nihal, and I was like, okay, sorry, <laughs> and I would totally step back and just like, okay, let's see what we can do, uh -huh. and I tell them, okay, if you do this, this is the consequences. If we do this, this is the consequences, mm -hmm. and then we choose together okay. what will be uh, what will be best for us um, as a, an organization mm -hmm. in this in a position in our own context. Mm -hmm. um, and, and for me, I have learned a lot, I have changed a lot, and I think it was also a transformational process for many of our members, or, because they also have learned. I have people who were just simply too scared to go and talk to strange people, and now they're initiating a lot of work, and they have their own ideas, they want to initiate campaigns, and I'm just like, calm hmm. down. Like, we're gonna do everything, we just need our time to do uh -huh. it. And it has been, a fantastic journey to be mm. honest so it is very but 
it was it took them it took us all of us to learn this that accountability right. that the decision we make affect us all and not just the people who are responsible mm -hmm. or the people who uh, signed those agreements so we are all in it right you know to win it okay. so. a real sense of the purpose yeah, yeah which was it's an idealistic um idealistic notion mm -hmm. but we decided mm -hmm. we're gonna sounds real mm -hmm. do it anyway mm -hmm. And uh, and holding each other accountable to that collective vision, because yeah. it comes up a lot in, in men's work, right? Because we're talk we're here talking about men's collective action on gender, sexual and gender-based violence, and where is the accountability from that work to the women's movement, which has been working on those issues for a long, long time? What's your sense of how that's working and could work better in your own experiences? the accountability of men's work to the women's movement? Um, not sure I understand what it means to say men's work. Um, and that's maybe because I'm particularly, I think that the, the framing of it is how we um, involve men in the work of gender mm -hmm. equality. Mm -hmm. um, and. I think there's a fine line between, for example, I don't necessarily agree that there should be a men's movement. I think there's a women's I mean, I know there's a women's movement. Um, and uh, I think that there should be an act of organizing in how we support to strengthen that women's movement mm -hmm. that very intentionally works toward gender equality and, and rights. Um, and so politically, that, that's somehow a bit different. I mean, we are in an organization like Sonke, we come up against it all the time. We are, um, we are not a man's organization or a men's organization. We are a human rights organization, a women's <coughs> rights organization, a feminist organization working toward gender justice, mm -hmm. working toward ending gender-based violence. And, and so the coming into the work uh, politically is very important. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, when, and that being said, being an organization that engages men and boys in ending, and I say it very carefully, in ending, particularly ending, m the heightened men's violence against women, first and foremost. Um, we come up against flack, and I often think um, it's really hard. It must be difficult to be a man working on engaging in gender equality and ending violence and working on with other men, where you are potentially alienated by, by men and potentially alienated by the women's movement or the feminist movement. Not trusted. Oh, not trusted. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. not trusted is an even better way of framing it. And so how do you locate yourself? And mm -hmm. the risk in, in it often is that your fallback position is to hold on to, um, but I am a progressive man or I am a feminist man and I, um, and so uh, I need to organize in ways that holds on to this, this idea of um, what about men mm -hmm. um, as opposed to what about us as humans? Mm -hmm. What about us as... Um, yeah. So I hope I'm making sense. Mm -hmm. and so it's a very careful balance, I yeah. think, uh, because on the other hand, hand, what you experience in this work is from the feminist movement itself, um, the backlash of, um, well, if things are so, if power relations and if, if, if things are so unequal, which they are, mm -hmm. um, resources are being channeled toward engaging men. Yeah. What does that mean then for women's rights or other women's rights organizations yeah. doing work on, on, on working with women and understanding how to, um, to live through um, uh, the violence and to, to begin to empower and capacitate themselves in, in different ways. So it's very... It, it's a loaded conversation mm -hmm. and there's no easy answer, but at the heart of that for me is that the work requires, it, it, I was saying this yesterday, there's such an urgency to mm -hmm. what we're experiencing in, in terms of gender-based violence 
that we don't have the luxury of holding on to dear life of what it means to be one kind of feminist or one kind of man that supports feminism mm -hmm. and, and rights. Mm -hmm. um, and often what we do is because we're holding on so dear, we lose the opportunity of organizing collectively together on, on, on what the end is. Right, the gender yeah. justice, right. Yeah. right. Satish, I know yeah. that has grown out of uh, the, the feminist socialist movement in India. How have you negotiated some of those tensions and how do you think about these issues of accountability? Yeah. Uh, first, uh, if you're taking the example of Maswa, uh, it is, one, as a principle we have to agree. And, uh, and uh, uh, two things, one is trust we have to build. Mm -hmm. Whether the, and how it will build depend on the context and the time. But without building the trust, it is very difficult to move forward. Mm -hmm. The other way, how much you are ready to uh, invite uh, very hard, the feminist who can uh, ask the question hard. Mm -hmm. And and you you feel that you, you have to respond to this and you cannot leave this because otherwise it is very easy those are coming to with hard questions mm. and you immediate uh, increase the distance. Uh -huh. The very practical way Maswa uh, designed that the, we are invite, going to invite this uh, feminist group in the advisory board mm -hmm. and, and use them as a mirror. So if anything we, are, we want to assess the change, we have to go and see whether the, what is their perspective of this change. Mm -hmm. Other very practical things to build the uh, trust was how many Maswa members is going to uh, uh, to stand with the feminist group in their own program, right. contributing their time and resources right. with their own program, and how much uh, they are uh, going to work in the leadership of that group, mm -hmm. and how many times they are inviting to review, to reflection, help the reflection and get the advice in their own program. So mm. This was the very much uh, some, the, some system developed within the organization and, and uh, the same way we have in the Center for Health and Social Justice we also adopted. Mm -hmm. So uh, keeping the feminist, strong feminist, socialist feminist group mm -hmm. uh, in our board, in our advisory, and, and allow them to uh, ask uh, hardly question in the public also. Mm -hmm. So uh, that uh, give us to uh, ensure the accountability toward the... So being open to be challenged, yeah, yeah, not being yeah, defensive, yeah. structuring it yeah, again. Yeah. 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 And, and we also found that there's a very, very energetic and positive result. Mm -hmm. Because when, the, when the we are in crisis, the feminist group was more closely stand uh, rather than the other, uh, other NGOs, other Huh. Uh, travelers. So I think this was another thing also. Mm -hmm. Very mm -hmm. good. Yeah. And showing up as allies in their, for yeah. their work. Yeah. yeah. That yeah. seems important. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we, uh, we understand that without allies it is very difficult. And, and the whole work with men will go, may go in the protectionist approach. Mm -hmm. and then, then maybe try to, uh, try to collect the resources and, and control the resources. Mm -hmm. There is a potential. Mm -hmm. So to ensure that uh, you are going to raise, you are going to always uh, uh, resolve the power relation. It is very uh, important to very close uh, relationship you have to build. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's quite interesting because when we first started, we struggled with a lot of people called us feminists, others called us women's rights organizations. Or, and basically that alienated a lot of men. Hmm. And we could not like at, at the beginning it was it was just people started coming and going and then saying, "Hey, they're calling us feminists as if it was an insult." Mm -hmm. And even though I I I I, um, I sort of explain what feminism is in my own understanding, it was an okay, but it's not us. Mm. So the decision on what to call our organization was just we are a social organization fighting for what's right. Mm because it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And within that, I have a lot of men 
whom I would categorize as feminists, but they would never call themselves that. It's just because the society would not uh, like would not accept them to that, and they are already a bit alienated because they're fighting for women's rights mm -hmm. and for fighting for their rights in space and mm -hmm. in public space and, and, and all that. Um, so at that point, I didn't feel the need to pressure them into calling yourself to calling us feminists. Mm -hmm. You know, I mm -hmm. thought that they should call themselves or label ourselves as as what the collective think we should be, as long as we're doing the work, as mm -hmm. long as we have the same beliefs. It's just at the end of their labels. Mm -hmm. it doesn't yeah. um, and at the same time, trying to help, uh, um, uh, trying to show and make men realize how powerful they are in such organizations, just because they're men. And did they get it? Some of them did, and to the point that they came and said to me, I'm so sorry you're a woman, but I am happy to be a man, to be honest. Like, I'm happy to be who I am because you're really oppressed and I'm happy to fight with you, but I'm happy it's not me. Hmm. You know? So they do get it and they're happy it's not them at the, at the same time, you know. And, and at that point I was like, okay, it's good that you understand that mm -hmm. and you know how much we suffer and it's good that you're here. Hmm. And that was enough for me at least personally as somebody who's trying to lead this organization mm -hmm. forward mm -hmm. and this is what we try to spread over and at the same time trying to push the women forward mm -hmm. into saying you need to take the lead mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know you need to show what we need what needs to be happening within this organization in order for change to happen mm -hmm. um, and, and so on it's a learning it's a great learning process because the idea was not to get people or men and women who already know the gender context, or what it means to be gender, or what it means to be a feminist, because at the end, we're, we're, it becomes a very small community mm -hmm. that just, you, you see them in every workshop, you see them in every conference, you see them everywhere, but they never change, and therefore the, the circle never grows. Mm. So the idea for us, or for me and my co-founders, was to build a new base. Right. And this, this need needed a lot more of um, sort of guidance and um, and trying to change our own members in the grassroots level before before we go into the community. And this happened over a year and a half, and and at the same time trying to getting the community engaged. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense to people or if it's acceptable to others, but it was to us at that point. It was successful to us because yeah. for the first time, men who has never ever thought of saying I'm going to defend a woman against sexual harassment did and they wasted their time, they were beaten up, they were alienated from their friends just because they wanted women to feel safe yeah. walking on the street and that was good for me. I didn't care at that point if they called themselves feminists yeah, yeah. or whatever women, you know, so. Did, did they talk about it just in terms of what it, what it meant for women to have a different kind of life or did they also talk about it in terms of what it meant for them to have a different kind of life? Um, they talked in the sense of, uh, I mean, when we do our community outreach and somebody says, look what she's wearing, for example, or look how she's behaving, or um, she's not behaving as a proper Egyptian woman or a proper Muslim woman, um, the men instantly respond back of, it's not really not, none of your business how she acts like and she has her own life she has her own choices just as you have your own choices and then they start sort of flipping uh, the coin of like as a man why are you just like that mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and why do you come out like that and we have um, one of our male members invented uh, co-founders actually invented this uh, they call it the 60 woman 60 seconds life of a woman in the morning and basically a woman, um, and it just says that we wake up, we have to think twice about what we're wearing, where are we going, which street are we taking, which bus are we taking, whether it was crowded or not, whether it's not crowded, like, and we can't take a cab because we mostly can't afford it and, mm -hmm. and all that, and, and he says, life of a man is that he wakes up, put on a shirt and a pants and he goes out, right. and it's fine. Hmm. And it just like clicks on everybody's heads, and mm -hmm. this came up with a man, mm -hmm. because he just was able to realize how we saw Hmm. Hmm. When you say that we don't need a men's movement, I, f I find that really interesting and I, I tend to agree. 
Uh, and I think part of the problem is um, this attachment that creates to, to being men. Uh, for one thing, it's sort of, we flip on to this idea of it's being a man, you know, the solutions to men's problems lie in, and maybe to women's problems lie in the way we are being men and therefore we have to be better men and so on and so on. Uh, at the same time, but they all, you also refer to the women, women's movement and, and that I also have, actually that's where I probably differ. And, and then I think, well, this women's movement is a bit of a, um, uh, uh, it's kind of an artifact. I, I don't believe there is a women's movement, although there is a, you know, a, a feminist fundamental course and project around women's subordination, discrimination and marginalization and, and yes, but that doesn't to me equate the women's movement, a, I think there are many women's movements and for many good reasons um, and they don't necessarily agree and, and that's a, an important starting point mm -hmm. to then begin to make alliances and have conversations. Um, I, think there, I think we can talk of you might say there are many feminist movements too, but you know, feminism as a project is definitely a, a force and, and a movement in some ways to me. And it's our attachment to masculinity as men and, and kind of womanhood or, or, you know, when gender identity becomes the marker of who is um, able to speak, who has a right uh, to speak and so on. At this, uh, so, in some ways, by, by sort of dissociating ourselves from masculinity or femininity or gender identity, we can then have a conversation about gender inequality. Mm -hmm. um, that is, that's why, for example, I like patriarchy as a way of framing this for men, particularly, because mm -hmm. then we can have a conversation about, well, this, this damages all of us, uh, women in particular, but it damages us as men as well. Mm -hmm. yeah and we can step, step out of that and look at our role in mm -hmm. that in a different way mm -hmm. to the, the idea that men are all, you know, many of the problems come about from men and therefore we as men have to take responsibility for all those problems. Yes, we do need to take responsibility for the power that we do have and, and so on. But to depersonalize it in, in a sense of it's not about essential two kinds of essential beings, you know, the gender binary where, where you have the victim and the, the perpetrator or the vulnerable and the mm -hmm. strong and mm -hmm. so on. Um, so, yeah, I'm going off on a tangent there slightly. Um, it doesn't take away the accountability and I think that's where it is important in work with men for gender equality as opposed to kind of a men's movement. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where it is important to come back to, and I think it's, much, it's one of the kind of frontiers where we are, I think, I think for this to become political and real for man, you will need, we will need consciousness, uh, critical consciousness in the same way as feminists, you know, women's movements, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, develop critical consciousness around empowerment and, and uh, so on. That is harder to achieve, I think, for groups of men um, who are structurally privileged. Um, I'm not saying it's, it's impossible, and as I'm, I just said before, m most men suffer under patriarchy. So we need to find a formula or a way of approaching gender inequality which dissociates men from masculinity and allows them to, to look at ourselves um, in, in a much more kind of critical way that, and I don't know what those strategies will be, I mean, how there are some, and, and I'm sure some of your work, for example, with um, male supremacy in the US, mm -hmm. you know, we need, we need new and more uh, better ways of, of working on critical consciousness raising mm -hmm. amongst men around gender injustice, and maybe that is to do it, link it with other social justice struggles, or right. other, strategies, but, or sexual rights struggles, or, mm -hmm. which is a social justice struggle, mm -hmm. and, uh, or, uh, you know, class struggles, race uh, issues, mm -hmm. um, 
Let's throw so it over to the audience one last time. Uh, so this whole emerging area of work around gender-based violence with men, you know, we have organisations with men in the title. Um, how do we think about that in terms of accountability to the women's movement? How has it looked in your experience and how should it look? Really, I've always had a problem with uh, when we, for instance, frame it like what you say, accountability mm -hmm. to the women's movement. Mm -hmm. Because in essence, for me, uh, I think when we work in the area of engaging and working with men and boys, it's not really about being accountable to the women's movement, but really realizing that whatever kind of work that we engage ourselves in is all about social justice, it's about humanity, as opposed to doing it for the sake of, in support of the women, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Because uh, for over a long period of time, we've seen this uh, feminization of victimization of, of feminization of violence, where the perpetrator is a man and the victim is always a woman. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that, that brings to question, where does that even put a, a male survivor of violence, for instance? Mm -hmm. And so I, I would like to see a shift from the way we perceive it, the way we look at it, from just uh, men are in this kind of work to support the women's movement or to support uh, or to stop violence because women for over a long period of time have gone through social injustices and um, historical injustices. But rather to help us raise the capacity and the understanding of men that whatever they are doing, whatever the reason for us to uh, challenge those historical injustices as really it's not only about a woman but also for their sake as men right yeah so uh, when we get to that point then uh, we we shall not be asking ourselves questions of whether men are in the process for genuine reasons rather for the resources that probably are coming from the donors and the funders uh, and other partners across the globe but really to emphasize uh, the bit about social justice I think um, the bottom line is the, the women's movement and the men's movement really need to work in tandem and in, in, uh, in, in concert so mm -hmm. that their efforts are not seen to be really um, working towards ensuring that men toe the line. Because uh, that, that for me is not what works. It's not about men towing the line but rather knowing and getting the understanding of their engagement in the, in the processes of social justice. Okay. On a broader scale. Yeah, yeah for me, it's, it, it goes back to the question of um, how do we see, let me use a very wrong word, uh, how do we see human nature? We say wrong word, nature. Do you, do you, do you, is there, a, is there, is there, um, is there a sense that uh, some people feel, would feel disempowered? Uh, we feel insecure because they lose power, you know. And if that is the, if that is true, do you need to develop a, do you need to develop a strategy around working with such people to make them understand that losing power may not may not really be bad for them. Mm -hmm. And if that is true, uh, is is that something you can do without proper organizing? Is that something you can do just by waking up in the morning and talking to a couple of people? Mm -hmm. Is that something you, you, you can do by pulling together a, tool, a, a bag of tools and mm -hmm. strategies and allies and friends and, and, and working on this in a coherent, strategic, uh, continuous manner uh, that builds gradually, uh, makes it, that allows you to make gains and work on those gains and, and uh, expand here again and, and 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 uh, um, <clears throat> and I, and work and achieve momentum over a long period of time. So if that is one way of thinking, then I I, I really don't think that uh, there is no need for a movement of men. Uh, to, but to be in this conversation, of what's the world we're trying to? Create so create. yeah, so the the world we are trying to is is of course we we have a sense of it whether it's achievable is not is 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 what is one thing, but I mean it's a world of of gender justice. It's mm -hmm. a world of uh, of not, not just gender justice. Mm -hmm. It's a world of uh, of 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 equity. Mm -hmm. It's a world of uh, of of.
fairness uh, that takes into account gender, mm -hmm. generation as well, uh, ability and as well as uh, right. dis disability, mm -hmm. uh, of, of race and, mm -hmm. and all that. In, in where, where I'm working right now, it's, um, most of the men who join our organization ha has a problem one way or the other with how the society is treating women. Yeah. And how when they are um, fighting for women's rights, they are portrayed as weak men or as even women. Mm -hmm. So they already have this problem mm -hmm. within them. And, and so joining an organization will support them on that, they feel more powerful mm -hmm. than they are into their, when they go back right, to their right. own communities. Right. And therefore, mm -hmm. it becomes their own safe space as well as much as it mm -hmm. is for women. Yeah. And, and this is for them what they gain. Mm -hmm. They have a safe space where they can practice also their beliefs and their thoughts without always being attacked or being under the spot or somebody is trying. A lot of people have said that we, a lot of men have said we have lost friends, but we have also gained a lot mm -hmm. from others. Mm -hmm. And we feel we respect ourselves more than we did before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this for me was a great game, mm -hmm. that they, and for them as well to continue doing this fight. Yeah, so. yeah. that's a great way to note on which to end. Yeah. The programme's yeah. over. Um, oh. Thank you very much. <laughs> Did you have one more final thing? Maybe just a little nugget um, to come back to how we started the conversation. I mean, we have, at the moment, we've just did, done an audit and we have 72 community action teams and on, uh, on count 1,700 community mobilizers across, across the country. 60% of them are men engaged in, 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 in the work and mm -hmm. then the rest are women. And they all mobilize around a campaign called One Man Can. Mm -hmm. So One Man Can End Violence. One Man Can uh, Be an Engaged Parent. Um, and, I, and I think that uh, I might so, it might sound repetitive, but the, the point is that it takes time, right? And, but how you, how you begin to engage is important. If you don't get that right at the very beginning, in mm -hmm. and, and, and whether that's talking about norms or power or sex and sexuality and um, privilege, um, it has to be from the fundamental understanding that at the end of the day, things are not equal. Right. And that the politics of things not being equal requires a one man can to understand that mm -hmm. it's not equal. Right. Um, and yeah. yeah.